From the heartland of America to every nation on earth, this is Jack Van Empey Presents The Truth in News and Commentary. Here now are doctors Jack and Rexella Van Empey. Welcome to Jack Van Impey Presents. If you watch our program every week, you know that last week we did a very special Easter program for you. And we're going to do another one today because in between last week and this week, of course, we had Lent and Good Friday. And we do want to repeat once again the glorious message that Jesus rose again. So this will also be an Easter program. And this first headline, I think you're going to find very interesting concerning Easter. The Easter message in the Old Testament. Whoa. And then Prime Minister Netanyahu lauds and praises evangelical groups for their support for Israel. And will we be the generation to see Jesus return? He rose again. He's coming again. We'll be, we be that generation. You know, sometimes I think women uh, sort of get jokes about them for talking so much. It's not hard for us, is it, ladies, to really uh, let it out sometimes. And we do talk a lot. And Jack, you would tell me about a joke about that. Yeah, this pastor was known for his 15-minute sermons. And it got around the city and the crowds came. And he always hit it right on the button. Well, this one Sunday, everything went wrong, and he preached an hour and a half, and the board members got together and said, you're going to ruin it all. They've been coming by the hundreds and thousands to hear you because they were 15-minute sermons. What did you do this morning? He said, well, you know, my wife and I both have false teeth, and I picked up her pair this morning <laughs> by mistake. <laughs> Amen. Oh, I don't wear false teeth, so... <laughs> <laughs> all right. I love all his jokes, don't you? It is a blessing sometimes to just laugh and enjoy ourselves. Uh, I wonder if you've ever talked to anybody recently who said that Jesus had his beginning in Bethlehem. He did not have his beginning in Bethlehem. Christ always existed from eternity. He was God, the second member of the Trinity. But God had a plan for Jesus when he came into this world. And he chose the Jewish people to send his son into the world. Take a look. Here is Mark Twain. And uh, he wrote a very interesting article concerning the Jews. Now, in this article, he talks about the Egyptian, Babylonian, and Persian empires that grew and fell apart. And then he went on to say how they saw uh, them actually vanish because they burned out somehow. But the Jew, the Jew was altogether different. And they could not be beaten away. In fact, they did nothing but expand. And all things, he went on to say, are mortal, but the Jew. And all other forces pass away, but the Jew remains. What is the secret, he asks, of the Jew's immortality? Unending existence. A very, very fine article about the Jew. And I'm going to ask Jack that question. What is the secret? of the Jews' immortality or his unending existence. All other empires fell away, as Mark Twain said, Jack. The love of Yahweh God for his chosen people, the Jew. Now, the Bible says in 1 Chronicles 21, 1, that Satan stood up against Israel, against the Jew. And you have even some Christians today who've taken that kind of stand along with the Muslims. And you know, I want you to know right now how deeply God, Yahweh is his name, love the Jew. They're his chosen people. Deuteronomy 7, verses 7 and 8. The Lord did not choose you because you were more in number than any other people, but because he loved you. They're also God's elect. Isaiah 42, 1, 45, 4, and chapter 65, verses 9 and 22. They're also the apple of his eye, Zechariah 2.8. And in 
Hosea 2, 19, he says, I am engaged unto you, Israel. And in Jeremiah 3, 14, I am married unto you. You're my wife. Now, someone wrote one day and said, well, then we Christians don't have much because he did all this for the Jew. Wait a minute. He sent his son. And we are the bride of Christ, Revelation 19, 7. Not only that, but we are chosen in Jesus for all eternity to be with him. And that is Titus 1.1 1, 1 and 1 Peter 1.2. Mm, I love it, Jack. And that tells me something, friends, that the Jews and the Christians should be very, very close. The Jews are God's chosen people, and we as Christians are chosen in the Lord also when we accept our Savior, the chosen people of the Lord. Now, I want to emphasize something here. Christians and Jews should love each other. In fact, uh, the prime minister there uh, gave a wonderful, wonderful speech to a group who really is backing the Jews. And here you see it, the Jerusalem Post, Prime Minister Laud's evangelical group's support. He was speaking to them and said, thank you for standing up for Israel. Netanyahu said to rapturous applause. We are witnessing a dramatic transformation in the relationship between Christians and Jews who are focusing now on the common values and the common future we both share. The Prime Minister also drew attention to what he described as threats to the Christian community across the Middle East, saying he was proud that Israel is the only place in the Middle East where Christians are free to practice their faith in complete freedom. Oh, thank the Lord for that. Now, we need to love each other because we pointed out to you time and again on our program how Christians are being slaughtered throughout the Middle East. Thank the Lord for Israel, Jack. We need to love each other. And it's into the millions that Christians are being slaughtered. We'll have a lot to say about that next week. Now, hear me very carefully. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love you, Israel. That's Psalm 122, verse 6. Now, we have the similarities. Rick Warren is trying to find the similarities between Christianity and Islam, and he forgets about the contrast. But when it comes to Judaism, we are right on together. Now, first of all, we have the same God, and his name is Yahweh, or the V. They can be interchanged. Yahweh or Yahweh. There is a tetramagraton of just four letters, Y-H-W-H, because the Jew did not want to break the commandment not to take his name in vain. So they had something they could not pronounce, and later they add the vowels. And that Yahweh of Judaism is the one when we pray and say, Our Father who art in heaven. It's also Yahweh for the Christian. Hallelujah. Secondly, we have the same Bible. There are 66 books here and 64 more written by Jews and just two by a Gentile called Luke who wrote the book of Luke and the book of Acts. Thirdly, we have the same 16 Old Testament prophets and to Jesus give all the Old Testament prophets witness that through him whosoever believeth in him should receive remission of sins. Fourthly, we have the same message. You're going to be shot today as we get into this. We have Christ as God. We have him as being virgin born. We see in the Old Testament his crucifixion and his resurrection and his return. <laughs> Isaiah 59, 20, <coughs> the Redeemer, that's Jesus, shall come to Jerusalem. And that ties right in with Revelation 19, verse 11, when he comes on the white horse and the armies in heaven follow in verse 14, and he comes as the king of the kings and lord of the lords. And the Old Testament says that too. Yes, Yahweh God says, I'll set my king on the holy hill of Jerusalem, Psalm 2.6. Ooh, Jack, that is exciting. Yeah, you know that, yeah. to hear that. Well, you know, Jewish scholars have certainly studied the Old Testament as well as the New Testament, like, like Jack said. Jews wrote both. 64 of the 66 books were written by Jews, and only Luke was the Gentile, of course, the two in the New Testament. Well, I want you to take a look here, please, at two of those who've written very, very fine things, the gospel according to Jewish scholars. Now, there is Mark Brentler and Amy Jill Levine. Take a look, please, at her, Jesus, 
through Jewish eyes, why Jewish New Testament professor Amy Jo Levine thinks Jews should know more about Jesus. Amen. My, oh, my, I really like that, believe me. Now, Jack, you, you mentioned you are going to be talking from the Old Testament yes. about all the things that uh, they have revealed. And they're going to be shocked. All Jews who listen to me will be shocked, as well as most of you Christians. It's alike. It's alike. It's alike. Well, my first question then, if it's alike, is this. Does the Old Testament teach the Trinity? Was Jesus always in existence the Son of God, Jack? Oh, Rex, this is tremendous stuff. Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. Now, wait a minute, his name is Yahweh. But when he acts in unison with the other two members of the Trinity, Christ and the Holy Spirit, the term Elohim is used because that's a plurality. Anything that ends in I am means more than one. Seraphim, cherubim, angels, but the I am is there. So here is a trinity. Now, can I prove it? Did Jesus help him, the Father Yahweh, create the world? Proverbs 30, verse 4. Who established all the ends of the earth? What's God's name? What's his son's name? Hey, there's a son thousands of years before he came to earth as the Son of God. Not only that, did the Holy Spirit have a part? Yes. Psalm 104 verse 30 says, He sent forth His Spirit and they, the humans, were created. And that's why we read in Genesis 1:26, Yahweh God speaking, saying, Let us make man in our image. You can't get a singular person out of us and our. They're was a trinity. And that's what the Bible teaches in the New Testament. Listen to Matthew 28, 19. Go ye therefore, teach them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There are three. And 1 John 5, 7 says, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word who is the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. Amen and amen. I believe God. There's that agreement, Old and New Testament. Oh, that's great, Jack. Now, there you have it, the pre-existence of Jesus in the Old and New Testament. Now, does the Bible uh, teach the Jews that there would be a virgin birth? Now, we as Christians all talk about the virgin birth, how that the Son of God would come uh, into existence through the virgin. Now, Jack, is that in the Old Testament? Isaiah 7, verse 14. Therefore, the Lord shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. In Matthew 1, where it's repeated in the New Testament, Emmanuel means God with us. He's God. You know, some of these Christians try to get around that by saying that could be uh, another term. A young woman will conceive. Boy, is that baloney. Why? God will give you a great sign. A young woman shall conceive. That happens a million times every couple of days in the goal situation. But a virgin birth, yes. God hath created a new thing in the earth. A woman shall compass him at only carry him. Because God did a special thing. He sent his son from heaven. Listen to this, Galatians 4, 4. When the fullness of the time was come that this eternal son who was with him, eternal son, Micah 5, verse 2, would do what was planned in Revelation 13, 8, that Christ was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. The Trinity sat down and planned his coming. Then what? Galatians 4, 4, when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son as what? The savior of the world, 1 John 4, 14. And oh, Rex Ella, he is God. Christ came who was overall God, blessed forever, Romans 9, 5. Great is the mystery of godliness that God was manifest in the flesh, 1 Timothy 3, 16. But let's go back to the Old Testament. Boy, is this rich. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. Unto us a child is born, virgin of birth. Unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. Well, that virgin birth came, and he grew to 33, but he never had the government on his shoulders. But it's coming. For that verse goes on to say, and that government shall be upon this son's shoulders. The son is the son of God. And listen to the next verse. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, hey, the mighty God. 
<laughs> and the Prince of Peace. Now you see how the two testaments, old and new, are agreeing. Mm. Are you surprised? When we were talking about this program, some of the verses that he gave to me did enlighten my mind once again as to how God gave to the Old Testament prophets the gospel message. Now, did they also know why the Savior was coming? Did they also know that he would be crucified? Did they also know that he would rise again? And we've been thinking so much about this Easter time. Jack, did they know all about this also? It's all there in the Old Testament. First of all, his crucifixion, Psalm 22, 16. They pierced my hands and my feet. That's when they drove the nails through his flesh to hang him on that tree. Not only that, but when he returns, the prophet Zechariah says that they cry out, Oh, it's he. We looked upon him whom we pierced as we put those nails in his hands and feet. And that is not the Jew who did it. He's not guilty. It's the Roman soldiers who did it. And just recently, Pope Benedict XVI wrote a book saying, I absolve the Jews of all of this. They're not guilty because Christ died for all of us. And if he hadn't died for all of us, none of us could ever get to heaven. But last week I used this, and I used the Jewish scripture. Then I'm going to use it again. Isaiah 53, beginning with verse 4. Surely... He hath borne our grief and carried our sorrow. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Listen. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our eternal peace was upon him. And with his stripes we're healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him, this is Judaism, the iniquity of us all. And that's the message of the New Testament. Paul said, I declare unto you the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 1. What is it, verses 3 and 4, that Christ died, he was buried, and he rose again the third day. Now, is the resurrection also in the Old Testament? Yes. Jesus is speaking, the Messiah of Israel. In Psalm 16, 10, you will not leave my flesh to see corruption. I'll be raised. And oh, do I love this. I think it's the most two precious verses in the entire Old Testament. Job chapter 19, verses 25 and 26. Now listen. I know, Job says, that my Redeemer, my Savior liveth, and that he shall reign at the latter day on the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy my body, in my flesh I will see my God. That's Jesus, the second member of the Trinity. Mm, what teaching, what teaching. Isn't it great to know that all that is found in the Old Testament? Now, one other thing that we as Christians truly believe, we believe Jesus. He said, if I go away, I will come again. How wonderful to know he's coming again. Now, does the Old Testament teach the second coming of Jesus and his reign on earth, Jack? I use this first already. I'm going to use it again. This is God the Father speaking in Psalm 2, verse 6, and he said, I will set my king, and that's Jesus, in Revelation 19, 16. What are you going to do with him? Yahweh, I'll set him on the holy hill of Jerusalem to rule and reign, and that's where he's going to reign, under his father, Yahweh God. And that's Luke 1, 32 and 33. Not only that, but... Zechariah says in chapter 2, verse 10, Sing and rejoice, O daughters of Jerusalem, for I, the Redeemer, will come unto you. And the Redeemer is the one God chose to come, and this Redeemer Christ was from old, from everlasting. And how do you know that? In Micah 5, 2, because he was to be born in Bethlehem, and he was. Matthew 2, verse 1. Oh, he's coming soon as the King of kings and Lord of lords. And I just saw something. When that 1,000-year kingdom is set up on the earth, I've never said this before, it will be a Judea-Christian group that's governing the world at that time. The law shall come out of Jerusalem. And that's why I like Luke 1, 32 and 33. Let me quote it. The angel Gabriel said to that virgin Mary, Your son shall be great, and he shall be called the son of the highest, and he shall sit upon the throne of David, a Jew. 
and he shall reign over the house of Israel forever and forever. Amen and amen. Oh, Jack. Judeo-Christian government. Amen. Well, now, could we be the generation that would see the return of the Lord? Could we really be that generation? I'd like for you to see something on the screen here. And it is Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion, members of the newly created State of Israel. They listened to him as he spoke, uh, talking about their independence as a nation, May 14, 1948, and something else. June 1967, they are rejoicing during the historic Six-Day War when they took Jerusalem. Now, who will be a friend to Israel? Who will be an enemy to Israel in these last days? Canada is Israel's best friend, says Foreign Affairs Minister there. And something else, Canada won't be silent in face of anti-Semitism. Good they for them. Speak up. Whoa, oh, our president, this is from the Wall Street Journal, an anti-Israel president. Well, has he turned over a new leaf? Obama, U.S. will always have Israel's back. Oh, my, oh, That's my. That's to get the vote, Rexella. Here we are. Well, the cartoonist took off on that. Rest assured, Bibi, I've got your back. And, of course, there's Bibi. And it says, kick me. Hmm. Going on. What part of this don't you understand, Netanyahu says to our president, Hamas, terrorists, drive Israel into the sea. Oh, my. And then Newsmax showdown. Iran. Plan for a second Holocaust must be stopped. And the former U.S. Ambassador of the United Nations, John Bolton, argues that Tehran's quest for nuclear weapons poses a grave and immediate threat to the United States and world peace. One more. Ayatollah, kill all Jews, annihilate Israel. And again, oh, there you see it. Iran ready to wipe Israel off the map. And Iran must attack Israel by 2014. Now, friends, going back to those first two headlines, Israel becoming a nation, 1948, taking Jerusalem, 1967. Does that really prove that Jesus is coming very soon, Jack? Oh, Rexella, it's the greatest sign ever. Why? People said, oh, no one can know the day and the hour, Matthew 24, verse 36. Put it in context, please. You begin with verse 33, Jesus speaking. He said, you will know when my return is near, even at the door. You'll almost hear the knock, but you won't know the day and the hour. But I'm going to say we are the generation. Why? Because in 63 BC, Pompey, the Roman general, came down to Israel and took the Jews away. And then empire after empire held them captive. And they had not been into their own nation for 2,011 years until that date, May 14th. 1948. Then they were also to capture Jerusalem. That hadn't been in their possession for 2,030 years. But the Six-Day War, they took Jerusalem. Now, why is that so important? Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus said, when you shall see all the signs of the four Gospels, and there had to be in Israel as a nation and in control of Jerusalem. No one lived to see it until our generation. It's here. And Jesus said, then it's at the door that I'm going to return. You'll almost hear the knock. But first there'll be a horrendous war. And that's Gog, Magog, Meshach, Tubal, and Rosh, cities in Russia now, Ezekiel 38, verses 1 and 2. It's the war of the latter years and latter days, verses 8 and 16. Along with Russia will be an Arab federation in Daniel 11:40, Isaiah 17, 1, Ezekiel 38, verses 5 to 7, and Psalm 83, verses 5 to 7. And China will come, Revelation 16, and join that amalgamation of nations. It'll be the bloodiest war in history, Revelation 9, verses 14, 18. And Iran's going to be a big part in it, as you heard a few minutes ago. Let's kill every Jew. It's here, ladies and gentlemen. And we are the generation that's not going to be alive for the return of Christ. Rejoice! Rejoice! And that's what we have been doing as we've been thinking about why Jesus came, Calvary, the resurrection. And now today we're thinking so much about his coming again. If the Lord comes, this message Jack has given us today, are you ready? Are you ready? That's why we've come into your home, that you might open your heart to the Lord. Jack, would you pray that prayer, please? Salvation in oh, Christ. Oh, dear Jewish friends, have you seen that Jesus is the way from your own Old Testament? And you folks among the Gentiles, do you see it's Jesus' Old and New Testament? He died for you. He loves you. 
He suffered on that cross that you saw today to save you. He wants you to be with him forever, but you have to ask him to come into your heart. Lord Jesus, your word says, if I call on you, you'll save me, and I'm calling on you. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the shed blood. Thank you for your love. Today, I want you as my Savior. Come into my heart, Jesus. In your name, I pray this. Amen. Amen. Oh, I trust that you prayed that prayer with Jack. And as I said last week, what a wonderful time of the year to do this. First Steps in the New Direction will be in the mail as soon as I hear from you. There's my address. Please write me. Oh, I pray God will bless you. And now, friends, our brand new offer that I mentioned last week, Enemies of the Cross of Christ. Take a look. The Apostle Paul, who slaughtered hundreds of Christians before his conversion to Christ, was forgiven and chosen to expose the enemies of the cross of Christ. Today, 132 nations proclaim their hatred for Christianity. Who are these ungodly enemies? Atheists, New Agers, cultists, Christian defectors, and Muslims. On billboards, atheists call our Lord a useless savior. New Agers state through Dr. Shookman's course on miracles, promoted on Oprah Winfrey show, that a slain Christ has no meaning. So do not make the pathetic air of clinging to the old rugged cross. Worse yet, Wycliffe, Sills, and Frontier Bible translators created a new version for Muslims eliminating Christ as the Son of God 91 times. By doing this, they've destroyed Christianity's message. This act denying that Jesus is the Son of God identifies these three translation groups as enemies of the cross of Christ and Antichrist's 1 John 2.22. Why did they do it? Since Muslim invaders entered Jerusalem in 637, they did away with all crosses. And that's the way it's been ever since. These 21st century enemies of the cross recently promoted ads on Australian television saying, move over Jesus for a new savior. For a complete study and expose on all these groups, order enemies of the cross. Oh, friends, there's the 800 number, there's the address. We need to have this, so here's our announcer to tell you how you can receive it. Chuck. Thank you, Rex Ella, my friend, to order Enemies of the Cross. Have your credit card ready and call toll-free 24 hours a day, 1-800-JBI-7777. To order by mail in the U.S., send your donation of $24.95 to Jack Vanapy Ministries, Box 7004, Troy, Michigan, 48007. In Canada, send your donation of $24.95 to Jack Vanapy Ministries of Canada, Box 1717, Postal Station A, Windsor, Ontario, NINA6Y1. Now back to Rex Sella. Make the call right now. You need to have this in your home. I want to leave you with this thought. The best motivation for living for Christ is the memory of the cross and the resurrection. Look forward to being your home again next week. And until then, remember, God cares for you. So do we. So very much. Bye-bye.